Thank you, and thank you, Senator Udall, for introducing us um, 383 and for your comments today. And so we'll look forward to working with you um, on that legislation as several pieces have been introduced, and the committee obviously has great interest in this. Uh, so now we're going to turn to our panel, and I've already introduced them, so I'm going to let them just make their uh, statements. Uh, but welcome to this committee, and thank you for uh, your input. So, uh, Mr. Sandalo, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Burke, and again, thank you, uh, all three of the uh, people at the table for being here today. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Sandalo. Um, you touched on the issue of substitutes, um, and it seems to me that there is no amount of mining that is going to fully address this issue. Um, you know, I've read some information about the University of Nebraska developing a permanent magnet that does not require rare earth, uh, rare earth elements at all, and the University of Delaware is trying to create a nano-composite magnet, uh, and if successful, this could use uh, a huge, you know, reduction in rare earth minerals, like 30 to 40 percent. Um, Japan is working on, is it ferrite magnets um, that don't need rare earths? So could you elaborate on your point about substitutes for rare earths and what will it take to bring those products to the marketplace? Thank you for the question, Madam Chairwoman. It's an extremely important area and uh, you're exactly right in saying that, that substitutes are critical to our work in this area. Uh, we at the Department of Energy are supporting work in developing substitutes. The ARPA-E program, for example, has a funding opportunity announcement looking at exactly this topic. Um, our energy efficiency and renewable energy program is looking at exactly the same types of issues. Um, in areas, um, you know, including uh, ma for not only for magnets, but, but lighting um, and other areas, we have the potential to develop substitutes, but it's going to require uh, government partnering uh, with industry in, in ways that are productive going forward. I think the uh, uh, basic research and development that needs to be done in this area is essential, and then government working with industry can make the steps that will really make a difference. The legislation that we have before us today, that doesn't do a lot in the area of substitutes. Is that correct? I would look to the sponsors. I, I, do think, I do think it's important that we do develop uh, substitutes and that we work you know, productively in that area. Okay. And Mr. Sandalo, do our scientists and engineers have enough data now to evaluate what our domestic resource is in critical, or do we need more work, or is there more work to be done there? You know, I, I, for mineral assessment, I would defer to Department of Interior and, and USGS, but you know, in general, data collection is an extremely important function of government, and it's one that needs to be funded adequately for the sake of our companies and our competitiveness. And what about workforce? Do we have the workforce there? It's such an important issue, and thank you for asking. Um, we, we do not. Um, education and training is a, huge, a very, very important issue in this area, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the educational resources that have gone into this area in other countries swamp those that have gone into those in our own country. And it's extremely important that we develop the trained workforce to, to take on this issue. Uh, could you elaborate on that? What kind, of, uh, what kind of investment did China or other people make in, in the skill level that was necessary? Because uh, I, well, I would assume it would be similar to mining in general, or no? Well, and it's also in chemistry and um, in, a variety, in a variety of technical, including engineering expertises that, um, that are essential to developing products in this area. Um, and you know, at the uh, Department of Energy, there has been expertise at the Ames National Lab in this area for many, many years. Um, but uh, that type of expertise uh, needs to be multiplied if this country is going to be fully competitive in this area in the years ahead. Okay, thank you. Ms. Burke, uh, obviously there's many of us here who have been seeking an update to the 1872 mining law, and uh, I'm, I'm certainly one of them. Um, how do you look at this in the context of of, uh, you know, we have royalties for oil and gas and coal. Should there be royalties on these minerals? Madam Chairman, is you aware that we have proposed legislation as part of the budget to take several minerals out of the mining law, uh, gold, copper, those sorts of uh, elements, but we have not looked at uh, what, what sort of royalty would be appropriate, if any, on rare earth or other critical minerals. Okay, and so do you believe that, uh, and how do you look at um, this inventory issue that we were just discussing? 
Do we have a good assessment of what the domestic resources are for critical uh, minerals and materials? I'll defer to Mr. Dobridge. Okay. Madam Chairman, when, um, Thank God there's not a fourth witness because you might defer to them. But anyway, right. go ahead. <laughs> um, the only minerals or elements or metals that have been systematically assessed on an actual basis are gold, silver, copper, lead, and zinc. And so um, rare earths and other minerals that are considered as critical have yet to be assessed nationally in a systematic way. And that, that's what we're preparing to do in the coming years. And what does that mean we're preparing to do? So we have a plan, we have the resources, we have a deadline. How we, long would it take? That. Yes, uh, we are um, in the process of uh, updating our national databases, uh, in the process of updating our deposit models uh, that are required to do these assessments. And um, one of the things that we've been involved with heavily over the last 10 years is a global assessment for uh, copper, potash, and platinum group elements. So we are waiting for the completion of that, which is happening at the end of this fiscal year, before we have human resources available then to embark on a, on a new national assessment. Okay, I think I'll come back when, uh, on a second round on this. Um, in going back and forth, uh, Senator Murkowski, would you like to ask questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Caffery. Um, I'm gonna start with you because you're talking, uh, you just finished your testimony here about, um, you know, the amount, if we considered the above ground mines, as you call them, then we are uh, certainly uh, endowed with a lot of resource. What do you think the barriers are um, to developing that supply chain? And do you think that it's uh, different than, you know, what we're doing with aluminum and gold? I mean, the, the recycling aspect of it. Well, I believe, I tried to illustrate that the, the whole recycling process has, has four parts to it. So definitely uh, we're very weak on the collection side and we're very weak on the pre-treatment side. Uh, the, the last step where we recover the different elements do exist, and we have systems in place for that already. But to get the materials to those different facilities is uh, the, the, the weak link in, in the whole recycling process. And what would, you, what would you suggest as strategies to try to deal with that barrier? Um, well, I believe that would be a study by the, the DOE or the, or, or or the federal agencies to look as to what is the best way to get to collect these products and keep them together and pre-treat them the right way. Today we do not have the solution as we concentrate on uh, the, the efficient recycling of the different end-of-life products. But I'm assuming there's no incentive either uh, in many of these uh, recycling markets that have failed to materialize so far. Uh, because the collection is so dispersed or uh, no one's come up with an economic model to benefit that recycler or uh, sometimes distance and transportation costs make it uneconomical. So do you think that this is about incenting recycling? Uh, there, there are different ways to go about it, but I think it's also a question of, of lacking of information. Um, I, I believe the, the, the automotive recyclers are well organized, but do they know exactly all the different elements that an automobile contains? We mentioned rare earths, permanent magnets. Uh, the automobile is a perfect example of, of containing a wide variety of permanent magnets, uh, but who exactly knows where they are or what is the best way to collect them before the automotive is, is the automobile is shredded. Because once it's shredded and goes to the steel industry, the different elements are lost. Okay. Mr. Duclos, you talked about a combination approach. Some efficiency, some new materials research, and recycling. Um, you know, I know that there's, you know, global companies in my state like Boeing and others who are looking at these um, markets. What, um, which of the approaches do you, when you look at this legislation, do you uh, support um, looking at, you know, reducing your risk as someone who is a critical, uh, you know, critical uh, manufacturer needing this material? What, what do you like on those strategies? Yeah, it's, uh, thanks for the question, because this is, this is a really a key part of the of the challenge, um, the, the fact is, is that 
the solution will be a mix of these five solutions and, and which one is in particular chosen, which set of, this, of these solutions is chosen, it depends on the element and it depends on the use of that element. Um, there may be some cases where uh, material substitution is more easily done and in that case that's a fairly clean uh, answer to the to the question involves uh, doing some research in order to uh, to develop those material substitutions. But in other cases, material substitution just may not be at all possible. And in the, and in those cases, you would look to the recycling and the and the manufacturing uh, efficiency to make sure that we're we're being as efficient as possible in the use of the material. So it's really a mix. And how important are we in this equation? By that I mean government. We asked the previous panel about. Uh, an assessment of where we are with these various materials, and, yeah. and it's clear we need to get more information from them. Is this something the private sector can handle on their own? The, these these challenges before us are great, uh, and and when we face an issue with with the material, we we face having to choose among those solutions. And the fact is is that there can be oftentimes parallel paths, and 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 the real challenge is at the beginning of this process to do that sort of fundamental pre-competitive understanding of materials and what materials properties can give can give what in a in a in a product can help definitely lead to you know which direction to go and and that's where the federal government can help in addition um, I, I think it's really important in terms of of federal government's help in collecting information uh, you know we will not publicly uh, say, you know, which materials we think are, are are critical. However, we would we would be willing to to give that information in a proprietary sense, and we have with the Department of Energy, for example, in their assessment. And I think that's a really important thing that 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 the government can do is collect that information, so we can see around corners and anticipate these challenges before they happen, so that we can implement th this this series of solutions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Price and Mr. Ersick, you both talked about this workforce issue, which we heard on the previous panel as part of this issue in, in the manufacturing uh, area or you know, getting people prepared because we've seen a decline in qualified people um, that is critical for minerals and materials. How might we encourage people in this particular area? What do you, what do you think is missing? Um, In the university uh, systems, uh, what stimulates bringing people into the workforce is typically uh, the research opportunities that are there to fund the graduate students to, and the postdocs to, to work in those arenas. And uh, those research opportunities, I think, are one of the, one of the main ways of, of taking a look at it. In that energy critical elements report, uh, we also talked about having some centers of excellence in uh, things like rare earth processing, element by element, on the most most critical uh, minerals that we're talking about. And uh, those kinds of centers are, are also a good way of approaching the problem. So it would be a combination of research opportunities that would help to train the the graduate students uh, and postdocs, and and then these centers of excellence, and, and I believe the Department of Energy is moving in that direction on on the processing side of things. Um, it it's really falls more on the shoulders of the USGS on the geological uh, aspects. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, Mr. Ersig. Thank you, Senator. I, I would also add that when. You know, through R&D collaborations such as the DOE grant programs, uh, ARPA-E's innovation programs, those are fantastic programs that create collaborative opportunities for commercial enterprises to work with universities. This has been a key function of, of our grant program as well. And once you can go to the universities and say, look, we've got this grant opportunity, this is the commercial aspects we see, it draws students to them. Uh, you know, fortunately, we've all been students before, and it's, it's difficult to, you know, to look at your career and say, wow, there's no career opportunities if I study this. So it, it's, a, it's a fantastic window to show, um, you know, our, our great students in science and uh, engineering, uh, you know, a path to commercialization. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Udall, and thanks for introducing your legislation. 
Um, I, I just had one follow-up. Um, Dr. Price, you talked about centers of excellence. Um, are there any centers that exist now, and where would you see that kind of um, collaboration? How would, how would that manifest its stuff, itself? As Mr. Uh, Sandalo said in his testimony or in, his, in response, uh, there is a, a rare earth element center of excellence at uh, Ames, Iowa. Uh, and that's the only one that I'm aware of that really focuses on a specific group of elements, and they've been doing research for many years on the, on the, um, the processing of rare, rare earth elements. Uh, that stands as an example of, of what our committee was recommending. Processing. Processing, meaning? The, the, uh, the big problem with rare earths is that they're chemically very similar. Uh, and uh, to separate them for the individual uses. If you want neodymium, mm -hmm. you have to separate okay. it from the other rare earth elements. And the, the process for doing that is an area fertile for continued research. And when it gets into the recycling issues, uh, separating then the rare earths from the other materials, if you wanted to separate the neodymium from iron, neodymium, boron, magnets, the uh, there's there's research that's needed to to do that. Well, how how would we look at how do you think we should look at this right now in the context of uh, that particular center and the challenge that's in front of us, uh, and 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 particularly this you know relationship between um, you know centers of excellence excellence in my mind are a combination with a little government resource of academia and the private sector business enterprise working together on joint collaborate on a collaborative approach for a solution. So uh, should we be you know given the challenge that we're facing looking being more aggressive having centers of excellence around particular areas of rare earth minerals? I mean is AIMS enough? Uh, what else do we need to do? I, I AIMS is a is a good start on the rare earth side of things. They do, they do not, however, focus very much on the geological aspects of it. Their, their part of it is looking at the, uh, more of the downstream uh, processing and supply sides, sides of things. Um, well, I, N I, I, NSF has very good models of, of uh, centers that are competitive in a peer-reviewed manner, uh, and, and DOE is uh, talking about various hubs of, of excellence, uh, and, and this could easily fall under their, their uh, approach to that problem. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following you. The, uh, having, having programs that are uh, peer-reviewed by the scientific community such that, such that we're getting the very best of uh, the research opportunities is, is generally the best way to go with these sorts of centers. Okay, but again, you mean on the specific materials and their in their usage? Y yes, or potential or the, potential usage. Yes, the. Uh, I mean, when you said geological earlier, uh, I'm one who wants to see what. First of all, I mean, obviously the dynamics are changing; they're constantly changing. I mean, in the Northwest, they're a big aerospace manufacturer, and they consider composites, they consider alloys, they consider future materials, back and forth. You know, these are you know, big decisions. So before we go uh, opening up mining all over again, we obviously want a lot of expertise on where the future is going with these materials. So I would think that if we needed more centers of excellence, it would be more in that area, less in the geological. So that's what I'm trying to have you help me understand your point. Yeah, I, I, rare earths is a, is a great example. Um, there are only two really big deposits in the world that have been contributing a whole lot to the rare earth supply. One big deposit in China and then the Mountain Pass deposit in California. Uh, there are a number of other rare earth deposits throughout the world, uh, none of which have been supplying uh, material at, at the levels that those two had. And there's a lot of opportunity for understanding how to extract uh, uh, the rare earth elements from those different types of deposits. They occur in different minerals. The, the one in California and the one in, in China are both in rare earth fluorocarbonates that have been relatively easy to 
process. But some of the other rare earth deposits throughout the world are in different minerals that have challenges in terms of, of extraction. Uh, and the fact that there are so few uh, deposits uh, really is a, a, a fertile area for the geological aspects. We, we can easily ask the question, why aren't we finding more? Uh, and there may well be other uh, rare earth deposits that are out there that need to be, de need to be looked at seriously. Uh, the USGS did its assessment. Uh, it was a sort of off from the basic literature that's out there. Uh, they looked at what the rare earth situation is like in the U.S., but they actually missed a number of, of uh, deposits that we know about that could be the long-term uh, resources, but they're in some cases different minerals that haven't been looked at all that seriously. So it would require then a combination of that sort of geological knowledge of what's out there, what some of these potential resources may be, then working with the process engineers, the metallurgists, extractive metallurgists, to try to figure out how do we best get those, those rare earths out of those minerals, and then the further downstream aspect. Certainly the, the recycling part of it is a, is a big piece as well. So it's a combination so thank of... You. Th yeah, thank you. That's helpful. And so what is an example of someplace where we haven't been looking on, an, on another rare earth, or I mean another extraction that we haven't been looking at? Um, the, um, and a good example there might be tellurium. Um, right now, the world's supply of tellurium is coming primarily from uh, a certain way of processing copper ores. Uh, and we, we actually don't know all that well where all the tellurium is in those copper ores. Uh, so there's research that's beginning to look into, into those issues. But um, we do know that certain types or certain processes are extracting the, the tellurium. Uh, it comes uh, these days from the sulfide ores uh, that are uh, characteristic of the, the big copper deposits in Chile and, and Peru and Arizona. Utah is another, another big producer. Those uh, copper ores have the tellurium presumably in with the co in with the copper minerals themselves. That's where it's being collected today. In Arizona, we process a lot of those copper minerals today using a different technique that is basically getting none of the tellurium. Uh, and so there's a there's a big issue of well, we know there's tellurium in those deposits. We're not extracting it. Can we do more to uh, to understand how to how to extract it from that uh, process. And just for the record, what would we do with tellurium? What's the what's the, the, the usage big, for the the big issue with tellurium these days in this energy critical arena has been that it's one of the preferred um, elements used in thin film photovoltaics. Cadmium telluride turns out to be one of the best approaches to thin, thin film photovoltaics for solar panels. And this would be a key part of that, that manufacturing process. That, that's correct. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I'm sure we could go on uh, with this uh, expertise at the panel. We thank you for your testimony today. I'm sure that if members have questions, we'll follow up uh, for the record. And again, we'll uh, keep consulting with you as we move forward on this legislative process. Thank you all very much. The hearing is adjourned.